Hi, so welcome back to STEM Builders GM. It's examination time, and today I'm going to be looking at some CSEC revision. So I'm going to be looking at the problematic areas first and what, um, what you can do to do better in these areas, as well as the multiple choice questions and the answers. So let's begin. All right. So of course, my name is Cavell Hilton, Chief STEM Ambassador for STEM Builders Learning Home. And I'm going to be looking at, so this was a workshop I did last week, Friday, and I'll be having another one um, Friday, July 10th. So smart people learn from everything and everyone, average people from their experiences, and stupid people already have all the answers. So I'm sure only smart people are joining. <laughs> so you will be open to learn from everything and everyone. So let's review some of the topics that you find problematic on paper one. So starting with the concept of surface area to volume ratio, plants, transport, execution, storage organs, growth movements, reproduction in plants. So when it comes to plants, it's always an area that I find students struggle because they can't relate as much as how they would relate to animals and human structures. Um, and then we'll also look at the structure and parts of seed or germination, phototrophism, etc. Genetic engineering, usually towards the end of the syllable, so you find that it's not covered in depth or as much as it should be. And so it's an area that students sometimes fall on as well. So let's start with the first big concept surface air versus volume ratio. So organisms can be big or small, single cellular or unicellular or multicellular. But whatever they are, big, small, unicellular, multicellular, the fact is all organisms are made up of cells. So to explain the surface area to volume ratio, when we're looking at the bacteria, which is a single cell organism, now, this bacteria, you're not seeing the, um, the slimy capsule cell wall. You're not seeing the flagellum. You're only seeing the cilia, therefore. So it's not that accurate. But here you have the cell membrane. And substances get to this unicellular organism by the process of diffusion. So one of the things that cells need to survive would be oxygen. So oxygen can easily diffuse across the cell membrane and into the cell. And the organism can use that to carry out its activities, such as respiration, and to provide energy. For large organisms, multicellular organisms like human beings, like us, you find that if we were to wait for oxygen to diffuse across our skin, it wouldn't happen. We would die right because our surface area to volume ratio is small so even though we are larger or the ratio that is a surface area to volume ratio is small and so diffusion alone is not sufficient so to get the nutrients and the gases and oxygen and stuff that we need we need a transport system so we have a circulatory system here for human beings and for plants. You know, plants have their xylem and fluid in their own transport system as well to get the things that they need. So why is diffusion alone not sufficient? Why we couldn't just use diffusion and, you know, get all the oxygen from the air and that would be it. Consider two cubes. So we have one cube here, which is one centimeter, and the other cube, two centimeters, right? No, one obviously is larger than the other. Let's look at the surface area. So for this, it's one centimeter, one by one centimeter. And we have six faces, right? So it's one centimeter each, and um, it's six faces. Well, this one is two centimeter by two centimeter. So that's four times six. 
So we're looking at 24. So six faces as well, two by two times two, four, four times six faces is 24. So the surface area for the small cube is six and the surface area for the large cube is 24. What is the volume? So if we were to calculate the volume now, the volume would be one for the small cube, right? And it would be eight, so two by two by two, that's eight for the large cube. So working out the surface area to volume ratio, it would be a six to one ratio, while for the large cube, it would be three to one. So therefore, the large cube have a smaller surface area to volume ratio compared to the small cube. So large organisms have a small surface area to volume ratio, while small organisms have a large surface area relative to their volume. So therefore they have a small, they have a large surface area to volume ratio. An amoeba contains all the oxygen it needs. So let's look at this first surface area to volume ratio question. An amoeba obtains all the oxygen it needs by diffusion via its cell membrane while a human needs to have special respiratory surfaces for this purpose. The best reason for this difference is that, A, the amoeba does not require much oxygen. B, oxygen cannot pass through the skin of a human. C, the human requires a larger volume of oxygen. D, a human surface area to volume ratio is too small for diffusion to be effective. And the answer is B. So as we mentioned before, diffusion alone is not sufficient human beings and other large multicellular organisms, their surface area to volume ratio is too small. Therefore, they would need a transport system because the fusion alone is not effective. So look at this next question. Large organisms cannot depend solely on diffusion for the uptake and transport of gases. This is because as organisms get larger, the A, surface area to volume ratio increases, B, surface area to volume ratio decreases, C, surface area and the volume both increase. D, surface area and the volume both decrease. So we can use the process of elimination and we will arrive at answer B. So surface area to volume ratio increases as organisms. So we can also highlight the key here, large organisms, right? So this is because as organisms get larger, their surface area to volume ratio decreases. The ones, the questions that say both, we could eliminate and focus on A and B, and B would be the part of the Big concept number two, plants transport excretion storage organs. So we're looking at plants now. Transporting plants, key points. Transpiration is evaporation of water at the surfaces of mesophyll cells, followed by the diffusion of water vapor through the stomata. Transpiration pool, on the other hand, is a loss of water by evaporation, and this creates a pool or a tension, and so water moves between the cells in the leaf and is pulled all the way up, so it moves up the xylem, and this is the reason water can move from the root to the leaves of even a very tall, tall plant, right? So that's because of the tension that water creates by pulling on the water between the cells. And so it's, it starts up moving in that direction, almost like a domino effect, I would say. So light intensity, humidity, temperature, and wind speed are all factors that affect the rate of transpiration. Plants have adaptations for water absorption. So, you know, xerophytes um, have adaptations for storage, absorption and all of that are reducing the rates of transpiration like succulent leaves, um, reduced leaves or sometimes tomato, etc. What does the xylem transport? So the xylem transports water and minerals and this is one way. So it goes in one direction only. And as mentioned before, you have transpiration. Pool water is being absorbed by the root hairs, capillarity, tension, cohesion, all of that's happening to pull the water up and water is lost by the leaves. The more water is lost by the leaves, the more water is pulled up because it's sort of create a demand and supply sort of situation there. 
to measure the rate of transpiration, you usually use a potometer, this is what one looks like. And sometimes we use a measuring cylinder and we measure the volume of water. In this case, we look at the movement of the air bubble. Flowing and storage. So in terms of translocation, that's what you call the process where the movement of sucrose and other organic compounds is taking place in the flowing. So the points that you need to remember is what's the difference between a source and a sink? So source is the organ where substances start their movement. Example, leaves. So in the leaves, photosynthesis takes place. So that's the source. And then it goes to other organs, example, the roots, the fruits, etc. That's a destination and therefore the sink. Movement in the phloem is by pressure flow. This is an active process that requires energy. So before with um, Transpiration, this is a passive process that doesn't require any energy. But in the case of translocation or movement in the flow, it's an active process. And you'll find that the companion cells contain numerous mitochondria that provides the energy for this process to take place. So in the xylem vessel, if we're comparing the two, in the xylem vessel, flow, of water and minerals is one direction. So it's going from the root to the tip, to the leaves, right? It's going upward. Water and minerals are moving that way. There are no end walls. So nothing to separate, they, it's just a long column, long tube, no end walls, no distinction between the cells there. But the, the walls are thick and stiffened with lignin, which provides that strength and ensure that it doesn't break, right? Because it's carrying a large volume of water for, against gravity. And so the thickened, the stiffened walls <laughs> with the lignin is what will prevent it, the column from the water breaking and all of that. So it gives it that strength and that support. As opposed to the flow of vessel here, direction of flow is two way, right? So it can go in either direction, moving sugar and other organic compounds, and the cells have end walls with perforations. So that's a sieve plate. Under which conditions will the, high, will the rate of transpiration in plants be highest? Sunny and low wind speed. So you're looking at light intensity here and wind. Sunny and high wind speed. Cloudy and low wind speed. Cloudy and high wind speed. So we just looked at the factors. I'm saying you have light intensity, wind, and uh, some others, they also have temperature. And of course, if they're sunny, you're also going to get high light intensity as well as heat and humidity. Humidity is a very important one as well. So in this case, the response would be B. So it's sunny, which is providing high light intensity and heat. So the temperature would increase and it's windy, so high wind speeds. All of those things would affect the rate of transpiration. And the fact that it would be highest, which is a key word here. Translocation of sucrose in plants occurs by a specialized vessel, which so is translocation and not transpiration. So our data and our cells, we can rule that out. Thin and hollow tubes can rule that out because that would be the xylem, and translocation takes place in the phloem. Abundant with mitochondria, that would be the companion cell. But instead, C is the best response, contains C pores in their end walls. Which of the following are reasons why transpiration is important to plants? Water and dissolved minerals are transported to the leaves. The leaves are cooled, unwanted, wat unwanted water is excreted from the leaves. So the response is one and two. A. In the transport of solutes in the phloem, the source is defined as any area of the plant where, just talked about the source and the sink. So remember the source is the, not, not, not. <laughs> so the source is where it originates, where it is made, right? And the sink is the destination. So the answer is C, sucrose is loaded into the phloem. So that is the source where sucrose is loaded, right? Which of the following is not a form of excretion in plants? Carbon dioxide diffusing in through the somatic substances being stored in the bark, water vapor diffusing out, stored calcium oxidate crystals in leaves, 
yung B fall. So no, B and B are correct because the question is asking not. This is saying diffusing in. So that is an indication since excretion is usually removal. So A is the correct response. We should have found options correctly matches the storage organs to their stored nutrients. So we're looking at roots, fruits, and the liver. So we know that the liver stores glycogen, right? It can also store small amounts of fat and stuff like that. Of course, it stores too much get fat to liver. Um, cirrhosis of the liver also if you drink alcohol. Uh, let's look, so the response, so we can eliminate D and B. Roots tend to store starch, right? Um, fats and oils are usually stored in the nuts or the seeds. The best response here is A. Remember that fruits can either store sucrose, glucose, or fructose combination. Food is stored in the bulb of an onion plant too. Okay. <laughs> so food is stored in the bulb of an onion plant too. B, provide for the growth of new plants from the buds. Which of the following currently describes movement in plants? So movement in plants is irreversible right and it's also growth movements or part movement so the stem or the leaves can move in case of the compass plant it tends to trap the sunlight so a part of it can move or you know the shamuli the plant the one that it touches and then it closes up all right next question is looking at phototrophism growth so it says after a few days the tallest shoot would most likely be so one you have a foil cap here, you have the light source, but this would be blocking the sun. Tip removed, so plants tend to grow in the tip, the meristematic region, so there is no tip. No tip means no oxygen, no growth, no hormone, no growth. Here you have this fully intact, the light above it. Here you have a transparent cap. So there is a cap here and the shoe. So the one with the most growth or the tallest shoot would most likely be three. So the answer is C. Where does fertilization of the egg cell or ovum occur in flowering plants? A, stigma, B, endosperm, C, pollen grain, D, embryo sac. And the answer is D. Refer to the following diagram of a flower. Which of the labored parts is responsible for the production of male gametes? So one would be what? Stigma on the style, and now you have the anther and the filament, right? So which of the parts is responsible for the production of male gametes? That would be number two, the anther. So answer is B. Refers to the following graph, which shows changes in the dry mass of an embryo and endosperm during germination. So here you have the embryo and you have the endosperm. From the graph, is it true? So we're looking at the positive. Is it true to say that the embryo begins to grow as the endosperm increases in mass? So no. So they're going in opposite directions, as you can see. So the best response here is D. As the embryo grows, the food reserves are gradually depleted. So you notice that the dry mass of the endosperm decreases as the embryo dry mass increases. Which of the following is the correct sequence for seed formation after fertilization? So after fertilization, you have the ovule being fertilized. This develops into a zygote. Zygote into an embryo, and in the embryo, the seed. So A is the correct response. Right, so I'll be looking at big concept number three in my next video. So stay tuned and get ready. <laughs> yes, I'll be looking at um, genetic engineering, mitosis, meiosis, artificial selection in my next video. So ensure that you join us. Um, remember to subscribe, like, and click that notification bell. Thank you. <laughs> See you next class.